Welcome to our procurement talk series. My name is Sarah Scudder. I host this monthly series along with our sponsors. We've got Eric and Ken and um, Anish and Sanjay who also sponsor this series. We got together, gosh, a little over a year ago and said, hey, we wanna help bring our community together to collaborate and network and share ideas. And we started doing these in different cities all around the US. We did about five or six a year and they were so successful. We said, you know what, we're gonna keep doing this. And then last year when COVID hit, we decided that we wanted to keep doing these and we shifted to doing them virtual online. And we decided to do it as a monthly series since we had so many people um, engaged and coming together to collaborate. So really, really excited to be able to continue to partner with them to bring the series all year. So our theme for this year is upping the ante. And this year we're focused on having procurement leaders from all over the world actually, and, and with many different disciplines and types of companies talk about what they're doing at their organizations to really add value and get a seat at that table. We've seen tremendous shifts in supply chain and procurement over the last 12 months and the role of procurement has been changing dramatically. So we're having leaders talk about how they're able to maximize procurement value at their companies. So I wanna do a big thank you to our sponsors, which allow us to bring this series to the procurement community at no cost. And I wanted to have Eric kick us off and talk a little bit about, Eric, um, how your company is innovating in the procurement and technology space. Sounds good. Thanks, Sarah. I do miss the in-person, but hey, this is the next best thing and we get to see each other monthly and you know, share our wisdom and get some good thoughts from the panelists. So thanks to the panelists and everyone joining today. So yeah, Rapid Ratings is a proud to be a sponsor of the 2021 Procurement Talks. And what we are is a SaaS-based algorithmic system or platform enabling financial health transparency and predictive insights between procurement or supply chain risk managers and their suppliers, whether they're public or private. And so we go out and get the private company financials and we provide predictive insights around that so you can lean in better and partner with those suppliers, particularly with what's happening over the last year and uh, collaborate better with the impacts with COVID-19. So we've been really busy and our clients have mitigated risk and we continue to help uh, procurement in that cause. So thank you, enjoy today's panel. And Eric, it looks like you have beautiful weather in New York. Yes, yeah, sorry, I look like a ghost here, but yes, it's, um, <laughs> it's very sunny. And so I've, uh, if I did it the other way, you'd probably It'd be too bright and white but yes it's it's really nice and almost 70 so i'll take it oh you need to make sure you get outside today yes thank eric, you eric thank you so much for being here and uh, love our partnership with rapid ratings you guys are doing some really cool things so keep up the good work thanks so much next up we have my friend ken also looks like very sunny and nice warm weather joining us from socal yeah, actually, it's weird today. It's raining today. We woke up to rain and it's raining right now. So I've, I think, Eric, I have your weather and you have mine. I don't know what happened there, but we don't have sunshine yet, but it's it's bright. But um, hey, thanks for letting me participate and meet you guys. I met a couple of you on, on LinkedIn last week, too. This is awesome to meet you guys. Um, long story short, what we do here at Worldwide Services is we provide the actual net or, or the maintenance on IT infrastructure. If you have routers, switches, servers, storage, things in your network that, that you're going to continue to keep that you want to extend the life on, that's where we come in as a hardware services company and give you that same next business day 24 by 7 maintenance solution, kind of what the OEM would give you. Um, so that's kind of what, what our, our, our lead training uh, is, but we do a whole host of other things. So I'm sure you'll you'll hear from me. I'll, I'll reach out to, to most of you on LinkedIn and see where I can help or, or just meet a new friend and keep networking until we can meet each other. So Thanks, and guys. Ken, it, it sounds like you're going to be coming to the Bay Area in June. So I look yeah. forward to being able to see you in person. Yep, yep. Talked to Jeff about that last night. We're good. Awesome. Thanks for being with us, Ken. Okay. Alrighty. So again, big thank you to our sponsors. Tequison is also our third sponsor. They were not able to join us today, but also doing some really cool things in the space. So thank you guys so much. 
So with that, a couple housekeeping notes, and then we are going to kick off the panel. I will turn things over to Serge here shortly. He will be moderating our panel for the day. At the very bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A and a chat function. So feel free if you have any questions for our panel today to put those in the Q&A and Serge will make sure to ask those throughout the conversation. We also have a chat function. So if you want to give a shout out, say hi, put funny random comments, feel free to do so in the chat throughout. So I want to um, do a quick intro to Serge. Um, he is moderating our panel today. So Serge is my neighbor here in the San Francisco Bay Area. We live about 15 minutes apart and I've known Serge for a few years now and really excited to have him moderate. He, he brings a really unique and interesting perspective to procurement and strategic sourcing. A couple fun facts about him and then I will let him talk a little bit about his consulting firm and, and what he's doing. So when immigrating from the former Soviet Union, Serge and his family spent three months in Rome while their entry application was being considered by US immigration. Not a bad place to be stuck hanging out. Serge did the running of the bulls in Pamlona after a night of drinking, and Serge, I can't pronounce the drink. You're going to have to pronounce it for me. <laughs> you put me on the spot. I can't remember the name, but it's basically a mix of uh, wine and um, and Coke. So um, he did the running of the bulls after a night of drinking wine with mixed Coke the day before he started his brand new job at McKenzie. So Serge, right. very, very brave of you. <laughs> and, he is, and he is working on what seems a lifelong and continually evasive goal of breaking 90 in golf. Serge, you and Ken, when Ken comes to visit, should golf. Ken's a big golfer as well. Ken, have you broken 90? Uh, yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, yeah. Serge, we're putting together a group on that Friday. I will let you know, um, Jeff from SIG, he wants to put it together. So I will make note of that, but yeah, it'll be fun. You better up your game, Serge, before, <laughs> before this golf. It'll be fun. We'll drink, we'll drink lots of uh, wine and Cokes all day long. I I'm down <laughs> with that. They have to bring some crown. I like a little crown with my Coke, but whatever, we'll figure it out. So with that, Serge, I'm gonna turn it over to you to kick off our panel discussion for today. Hey, thanks, Sarah. I appreciate it. Um, again, thanks to the sponsors in our center for making this possible. Um, we've got a really exciting talk today. Um, we have four professionals who bring uh, close to 100 years of experience um, to share with all of you. Um, as, a, as a quick uh, quick aside on me and, and Sourcing Advisors Group, we're uh, a small consulting firm focus principally on strategic sourcing. So we take clients from a data dump of their AP and PO data all the way through signed contracts with suppliers. And in the process, uh, we have uh, a track record of helping clients improve the quality of service they receive from suppliers while also um, achieving 20% uh, cost takeout across the board. Um, so with that, um, let me turn back to the discussion. Um, today's themes um, are, I think in areas that are um, evergreen and uh, germane to procurement strategic sourcing. And they include things, uh, uh, topics like, you know, how can teams create insights? Um, how can we, better influence stakeholders and build credibility. And um, um, third, you know, how can we best deliver value to our organizations? Um, and so before we kick off, I wanna do a quick round of introductions for the panel. Um, Leanne, maybe you can kick us off and introduce yourself. You're, Leanne, you're on mute. 
Well, thank you, Serge. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you, Sarah, um, for inviting me along this evening. So in the UK, it's at 6pm at night. Um, so apologies if my lighting's not, not quite um, as good as everyone else's. Delighted to be here this evening. Um, so for anyone, obviously I know Sarah very well, but for everyone else, um, my name's Leanne McCabe and I work at a company in the UK called Virgin Money, which is a banking organisation. Um, and I'm responsible for all the brand and marketing procurement at Virgin Money. I've been here for a few years. Um, and prior to that, um, my whole career really has predominantly been in financial services. Um, be, before um, working in marketing procurement, I was in a sales and marketing role previously. So I'm um, sort of sub early, under 10 years in terms of my procurement expertise, but the majority of my career has been in sales and marketing. And that really, I'll go and talk to that as I go through some of the, the answers to my questions. But I very much leverage the fact that I've been business side and I understand the category quite deeply from a, a business point of view. Um, outside of work, I'm a very passionate learner. Um, I like being active, socialising with friends. And I have a 15 year old son that I spend the majority of my free time with. So lovely to meet you all and looking forward to getting into the discussion. Thanks for that, Leanne. Anna, can, can you continue, please, and introduce yourself? Hi, thanks, Serge. Um, my name is Anna Price. I am a consultant with uh, Procurgens. Uh, we are a small boutique consulting company that help corporate buyers and procurement managers um, work better within their travel programs. And when we talk about travel programs, we talk about uh, meetings, events, incentive trips, so the whole gambit that goes in there. It, it's a love to hate category for most people. Um, we all love to travel. We just hate to buy it and then manage it. Um, but uh, this is just one of those areas that I fell in love with very early on in my career. And it's just been a passion of mine um, ever since. Um, when I'm not doing consulting work, I like traveling like everybody else. Um, my background is actually from Montana. It's um, a place where, which I'm incredibly fond of. And we're actually moving to Montana at some point, we're starting to build a house over there. So we're very, very excited about it. So talk about pain points in, in buying things. Yes, we are experiencing it from mm -hmm. buying and building a house. So, uh, but that's me. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Yungi, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Great. Um, thanks for having me. It's great to be here and happy to be part of this discussion and learn from the other sourcing leaders as well. Um, so I actually didn't take a very direct path to procurement and sourcing. I, I started my career doing auditing and consulting, um, first at Ernst Young and then at Motorola. Um, I learned a lot about risk and controls and process maturity and just really being able to spend, you know, like a month or two at a time in different businesses, right, at, over all over the world and, and learning what they do and, and helping to advise on how to get it done better. Um, it was a really fantastic experience, but I think what I learned about myself was I, one, I love to travel, but two, um, I really prefer to be able to do rather than to advise. So I ended up launching from that. Normally people go into finance. Um, I went into operational roles and I got to do a lot of really different things, um, but eventually ended up in a procurement role, um, which, you know, wasn't really something that was a logical next step, but I ended up working on a team. Um, where we were outsourcing really the, the manufacturing and design of mobile devices at Motorola. Um, that group ended up being sold to Google and then Lenovo. Um, throughout that reorganization, I ended up uh, going to the division in Motorola that is now Motorola Solutions. They sell public safety radio systems to the federal government. Um, that was really sort of my, my entrance into this niche area of government contracting. Um, I was supporting government sales, uh, negotiating contracts with contracting officers in the federal government. It was really fascinating, learned a lot. Um, and, and so when the opportunity came for me to go to Verizon, I was really excited because they were looking for a sourcing person that had government contracting sales experience. And so for the first time in my career at that point, I was actually qualified for something I was, I was going to be doing next. So, um, I you know, got to really dive into that area and it was kind of the wild west, right? So anything the salesperson would sell to the government, um, you know, we would have to find a way to procure. So it could be anything. It could be a widget, it could be a really complex managed service. So I um, definitely learned a lot there as well. Um, recently joined about a year ago, Care First. Um, Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield is a not-for-profit. Not um, it's the largest healthcare company here in the mid-Atlantic region. I'm based in the DC, Washington DC metro area here in the US. 
um, it's a really exciting place to work. And, and part of that is because there are, there's so much change that's happening right now internal to the business. Um, we're doing a lot of really sort of um, core, you know, core business transformation, which involves really looking at, you know, overhauling the systems, the processes, the technology, the people, it's everything. Um, and so a lot of change, super exciting. Um, but we're also having to figure out how to continue improving how we support our customers in the short term, as well as um, delivering, right? So the, sort of that large scale, massive change that needs to happen to be able to um, strategically support them over the longer term to, you know, in, in a better way. So it's, it's been an exciting ride and I'm excited to hear more from you guys as well. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you for that. And uh, last but not least, Sean, um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Hey, Serge, how's it going, man? Good to see you, as always. Yeah. yeah. And and ladies, thanks for allowing me to share uh, share the stage with you. I'll just sit in the back and carry your luggage when everyone's done. <laughs> <laughs> My name is G. Sean Williams. I'm a, a certified professional supply management uh, and head of procurement for Floor and Decor. If you haven't been inside of a Floor and Decor, you is a must do. Uh, put it on your bucket list, right? Uh, but it's 85,000 square feet plus or minus of flooring. And I got to be honest with you, I took for granted what that meant <laughs> before, before I worked for Floor and Decor. And so amazing company, if you're doing anything, please consider, please consider us. Uh, but, you know, my background, you know, some people ease into their career and some people at the end kind of slow down. I think in the middle of my career, I had to slow down, right? And so, uh, uh, eight years ago, I had a, a death in the family, and my mother got uh, diagnosed with uh, now Hopkins lymphoma cancer. And it was the worst and the best thing to happen to me because it gave me an opportunity to find out if I truly love this passion, and the answer is yes. Procurement and supply chain, I love this passion. And so some of the cool things that I got a chance to do over the last eight years, I've traveled the world and taught thousands of people procurement and supply chain. We started up the Women's Business uh, Center, Supply Chain Center of Excellence. We've done university supply chain case competitions under the Institute for Supply Management, Carolinas, Virginia. We've done small business initiatives, supplier performance initiatives. Everything is circled around supply chain. And it wasn't on purpose. It was just the fact that supply chain really does drive a global economy. And so I'm glad to be here and look forward to the, uh, the chat today and sharing a little bit more. Awesome. Uh, so we've, we've got an amazing wealth of insights and experiences um, uh, on this call today. So let's let's get right into it. You know, I, I think few will, will argue that procurement has had an unprecedented level of, ex, of exposure during the past year, um, driven principally by the disruption of this COVID. Um, uh, yet I think many of the challenges facing us and procurement strategic sourcing teams remain the same. You know, how do we create insights that make difference to our organizations? Um, you know, in part, this may be through addressing, you know, uh, addressing the, the long-term disequilibrium of information favoring vendors. You know, it could be through data-driven insights or perhaps other ways. Leanne, can you tell us how you bring uh, external insights into um, your organization to add value? Yep, Serge, happy to kick things off um, in this topic area, so thank you so much. Um, so in terms of from how I've been executing that at, at Virgin Money and also in some of my previous roles, as I mentioned previously, I look after brand and marketing and one of the big areas of spend that we have in that category is in the media space. Um, so I'm sure lots of brands invest lots of money in media. Um, and so very much it's, it's a move-in market. Um, there's been lots of things come out publicly around transparency, um, around value for money, around brands and clients understanding exactly what's happening with their money in the media uh, marketplace. So I've, I've very much have stayed close to all of the developments that have happened with that. I've you know, leveraged my connections um, in marketing procurement across other big global brands. Virgin Money is a UK only brand, but I've got lots of friends in the industry and just keeping each other abreast of all of these changes and what impact they need to have 
in terms of our contractual agreements. So um, for brand and marketing, it is one of the tougher categories um, from a stakeholder point of view to really win credibility in. So it's been really important for me in the three years that I've been here to be able to bring that external industry knowledge and expertise and explain what that means for Virgin Money and what we should be doing with our contracts and our relationships to make sure that we're not being exposed to some of these commercial risks that are presenting themselves in the market around media and media agencies managing your brand spend. So um, very much um, that's been one of the key wins for me in terms of building that credibility with my stakeholders here. That's awesome. Um, and the COVID has been particularly brutal to the travel sector, uh, right? As we all know, travel is is a fraction of what it used to be. You know, events have gone virtual, uh, if not canceled. Um, as, a, as a consultant with a bird's eye view on the sector, what advice can you share with the procurement teams as to how they can better understand and measure and report successes of their programs? you know, uh, this year, next year, and going forward. Oh, thank you, Serge. Um, I can kind of piggyback exactly on what Leanne was saying. Um, one of the things that I think COVID um, exposed was, again, the risk that many companies have allowed themselves to, to fall into, which is having un I want to say unqualified, but uh, folks that aren't necessarily skilled in managing complex negotiations when it comes to travel. Most folks would think around travel, I'm booking an airline ticket and it's super easy and that's that. Um, but it really got exposed tremendously in the meetings and events space where, you know, as COVID was rolling in, you know, people were having to cancel millions and millions of dollars worth of meetings and events and also the pivot that had to go with it. So I think it actually exposed a lot of risk that organizations was not aware of. And they were actually allowing folks not in legal or procurement insights into these agreements. And, you know, they were hit, getting hit with penalties left, right and center. Companies that had weathered the storm really well had a managed program in place. They had a strategy on how to, you know, cancel out of meetings, how to pivot into meetings and how to delay meetings without incurring costs. Um, and also kind of piggybacking on what, what Leanne was saying, you know, value and transparency is another area that a lot of people um, did not have insights into. And that's a theme that we're going to see going forward into, you know, 21 and uh, 21 and 22 and forward. Um, buyers are now asking um, more transparency from suppliers. There is a lot of, I call it the spaghetti bowl of transactions and pass throughs that happen in the travel space. There's a lot of rebates and kickbacks that happen in the travel space. And previously that wasn't transparent. And so to untangle that mess and actually make it transparent is probably one of the hardest conversations that buyers are having to have with their suppliers. And if you aren't seasoned or skilled in that area, it is a very complex conversation to have because you don't know what, what is being exchanged in the background. So asking the right questions is incredibly important. And probably also making sure that you're having those conversations at the right level with Absolutely. your uh, supplier, right? Absolutely. I mean, and one of the things is, um, you know, people were just, you know, we were all taking ticky tours, as I like to say, uh, pre-COVID. You know, there's a lot of trips happening that, you know, wasn't necessarily necessary. Um, and, you know, part of COVID, what happened is travel budgets have shrunk. So there's a lot less money on the table for people to take trips. There's a lot more scrutiny on travel for a variety of reasons. And the average ticket cost or price uh, per trip is going to go up uh, purely because of natural contraction that's happened in the industry. True. So having the ability to communicate those changes to your leadership and providing them line of sight on what's happening is, is crucial. So if you don't have the appropriate technology or insights into, I have 100 meetings this year planned and it's X amount of dollars. And, you know, if COVID rolls in, I have to cancel that and I could potentially incur more penalties. The other thing that is happening is all those airline tickets that got canceled in 2020 is now sitting in a ticket bank somewhere. That's money you've already spent in your organization. You now need to go manage that. And if you don't have a handle on that and you don't have a strategy on that, that is money that you just wasted. It's, it's an opportunity you need to reinvest and actually direct appropriately as well. Talk about fascinating insights in a category that many have left for dead or seemingly left for dead, right, during COVID. Um, yeah, you, it's... It, 
it's been very it's it's very interesting because it's one of those categories that like I said you know it's a love to hate category sometimes it's complex it's incredibly emotional I think if you ask any procurement professional what's the one category they probably don't want to touch with a 10 foot pole it's probably going to be travel um, because we all love to travel but we sure as hell don't want to manage it on a day-to-day -day basis because it's emotional people get very emotional for, uh, when it comes to their business trips and being on a plane and loyalty programs play a role and there's just so many moving parts to it. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, from, from the from the perspective of government contracting, you mean what makes procurement sourcing unique? Yeah. Um, so definitely, when you're sourcing and buying on behalf of government, there's another layer of vetting and compliance and oversight that you need to consider. But in, in other ways, it's really there is a lot that's similar too. So to what Anna was saying, you know, ensuring that there's transparency to what you're getting in the pricing. Um, being able to justify to the government that the price that you're you're paying your supplier or that you're charging to the government is fair and reasonable that all plays a big factor in the process um you know to support government sales i think what's unique in this space is that sourcing plays a pretty big role in that pre-government customer award process right to be able to ensure that your, your suppliers um, are able to support and deliver everything that your company is wanting to commit to do for the government so um, and especially if you're buying something that's much more complex than, than just, you know, like a commercial off the shelf item or equipment, um, you know, if you're talking about managed services or cloud services or, or even anything that's customizable, right? Um, there's definitely a complex aspect to that that you need to vet. And there's often even, you know, small and diverse business spend goals that need to be met in support of a government contract. And so you need to spend time building a stable of, you know, vetted and reliable suppliers that you can count on to help you meet those goals. Um, and quickly, right? And in addition to finding suppliers that can meet the standard technical or business and pricing requirements, you also have um, specific government flow down clauses, right? In the contracts that, um, you know, you may have to take from the government customer and then you also may be required to pass on to your suppliers. And so making sure that, that you negotiate with your suppliers in a way that they know what those flow down requirements are and that they've priced that into their proposal to you and they understand what that obligation is, that's also, um, a big part of it. So, I mean, all these negotiation, you know, all the negotiation and supplier vetting that you have to do, hopefully in advance of committing to something, but, right, that you're proposing to the government customer, um, is, is, it takes a lot of time. And so, honestly, that you know, there's times when your, your salespeople are like, I don't have time to spend doing all those vetting activities with you. And, and so, um, and on top of that, you know, you could spend a lot of time with suppliers negotiating deals that may never end up getting signed if you fail to win that customer award. So um, it's sort of a, you know, you have to weigh the time that you invest into that and, and the risk that you're trying to mitigate. Um, you know, there's not a guarantee you're gonna get the award or that the supplier will get the award from you. So it's not always easy to convince the business to, to spend that time, but it's really critical that you do mitigate those business and financial risks if you wanna do work for the federal government or any government entity. <sighs> Yeah, that's perfect. I mean, I, I think that that carries over to the private industry as well, right? I mean, generating, doing your due diligence and actually digging um, creates a lot of value. And uh, to your point, um, oftentimes there's precious little time for teams to do that. So, Giselle, um, how, how do you see the bar being raised for market intelligence and insights? We already talked a little bit about this, but what are you seeing from your perch? You know, Serge, um, we talked about COVID and, and not to talk about COVID and the adjustments that it's made to the supply chain, but it's real. Um, the worst, I think one of the worst things that can happen to our profession is business as usual. You know, we just come in, we negotiate a deal, we get a contract in place, we store it somewhere and somebody has a problem, they call us. I think that's one of the worst things. Like I talk about the death of procurement. Uh, and, and so, you know, COVID really shook things up. And in a lot of cases, those suppliers that, huge suppliers that you thought you'll never have a supply interruption with, we had supply interruptions. I remember walking into a Target and thinking, is this real? There's no bathroom tissue on the shelf? How is this even possible? Blew my mind, a Target in the metropolitan area. How is it even possible? And, and so we realize that we got to truly understand source, not sourcing. We use the term sourcing manager so, so vaguely, 
we have to understand source. I was thinking about this earlier today. We are the biggest source brokers in the world. And how do we broker a deal between suppliers and our corporations to get what we need, when we need it, and where we need it to be? And so what comes along with that is that market intelligence. How do we understand not only our supply base, but then tier two, tier three, and what's going on in the global economy? I, I think about, and this blew my mind, I, I think about distiller grains. I, I didn't really know what uh, distillers grains were. Uh, before I realized that we're having a problem feeding cows during the pandemic. I was like, how is this even possible? Cows? How's that a thing that's, that's a topic right now? And I realized, well, no one's driving. And if no one's driving, then there's a less production of ethanol. There's less production of ethanol, then there's less production of ethanol disilligrains. And if there's less production of ethanol disilligrains, then there's less production of cow feed. Wow. And, and so think about how this world is connected and how we need to understand from a market intelligence perspective, the actual supply chains to be able to broker these deals as uh, source brokers. And so I think that's, that's key. And one of the, and so, so people say, well, how do you do that? All right, this, this is, we don't have enough time to talk about how you do that. But I'll, I'll tell you the first step, we gotta understand data and we gotta display data. All right, that's the first step of building relationships with our stakeholders. In the market, the market intelligence space is understanding data and being able to display data as, a, I guess, source broker. <laughs> um, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and then that actually provides us with a great transition to uh, a topic that I know we all care about, and that's you know influencing our stakeholders, right, based on the insights we generate from our peers, from market, from our expertise, from data. Right, so um, I mean, it, it is no secret that being able to influence our stakeholders is one of the key factors for success. Um, and and, and I, I don't know that that's ever gonna change as a formula. Um, Leanne, um, how do you influence stakeholders? And you know, to among other things, you know, we see the benefits of an effective supplier relationship management program. Hi, Serge. Um, so as I sort of touched on in my introduction, one of the key ways that I've, I've been able to do this quite successfully and the roles in which I've undertaken market and procurement is very much making sure that I can communicate properly with the business, that I understand marketing, that I've got good connections and contacts. So credibility is definitely formed by being able to understand their world. Um, and I'm sure Sarah will back me up that, you know, brand and market and people do say that they're special and unique. And it's quite important that whether you agree or disagree with some of that, that you really understand where they're trying to come from. And when it comes to things like procurement, um, they're certainly one of the categories, as I've said, that are, that are sort of usually least enthusiastic. They, they kind of run at a certain pace and um, they don't always want to go through very traditional um, procurement type governance sorts of processes. So things like that just don't talk to their creative imaginations, if you like. So kind of one of the things that I've spent a, um, a considerable amount of time in is in that supplier relationship management space and getting them to see as marketing people what the actual benefits are. You know, if you're going to do the SRM effectively, it does take considerable time and effort and you very much have to sell to them what the value to them is going to be if they're going to invest any of their time and their people's time in doing this. So, um, but, but they have the same frustrations as everyone. So they're very much, you know, having to manage the agency day to day. They're having to react to things the agency are not doing. So you kind of have to sell that if you can put stronger governance programs in place um, within contracts and in terms of operational processes, um, it's going to minimise the amount of time that you're spending on a reactive basis, having to manage the agency and all of the things that they're doing for you when things don't always go the way that you intend them to. Um, being able to sell that, you know, if, if we have strong governance and reporting and meetings and, and what have you, then, then very much it leads to better quality delivery, innovation opportunities. So trying to get them to see that it's very much worth spending that time up front and that you'll see the benefit of that maybe further down the line. 
Um, and, and for us, the, the market's very competitive. So, so it's not just about what the, what the agency or the supplier is doing for you, but if you can have a good mutually beneficial relationship, you almost want to be seen as being a brand or a client of choice for, for that vendor in terms of getting early exposure or being able to test proofs of concept. So I think it's quite important to deliver SRM in, in a strong way because I actually think it comes back the other way in terms of that vendor or that supplier. Um, being more forthcoming with you and your brand and giving you quite good early opportunities at, at new innovation. So um, it, it's definitely about almost making a market and pitch to market and about what it is they, that they get out of some of these things. Um, and in terms of some of the other things I think that we bring that's not naturally a skill for them in terms of helping them to do that really well is helping them develop scorecards, helping them to understand and develop 360 feedback processes. So I think it's about some of the technical expertise that we have from procurement that don't naturally exist within marketing and creative people and helping them to design some of these frameworks and processes and almost making it really straightforward and easy for them. And, and, and in my role, I very much help to design all of that, work with the supplier to understand how that's all going to work, working with brand and marketing. So you're almost the conduit to get the SRM program up and running um, and, and there to manage it through to make sure it's continuing to be effective. But I think they very much then look to you and say, well, they see you as someone that knows how to do that really well and they start to see the benefit from it, which means that they're much more likely um, to keep up with it. But I think it's really important because we spend a lot of time in the pitch and the selection process and the commercial negotiation and the contract and the value just starts to erode itself if you don't continue to manage it effectively um, on an ongoing basis. And as much as their brand and market and people are good at what they do, that's not a natural skill for them. So I think they very much see the value and what we can bring to, to the party with something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, and and, and as, as, as we begin to come back to normalcy, whatever that means for us, um, how can procurement teams measure report successes going forward? I think I can kind of carry on on um, a couple of things that just Sean and Leanne has brought up. Um, I think, you know, the biggest mistake any organization can make right now is to actually manage um, corporate travel uh, meetings and events in the business as usual space. Um, that world basically got turned upside down and the way you were either procuring travel, um, measuring travel and um, you know, communicating travel has fundamentally changed in all areas. Um, what we are seeing is um, a lot of the, in the travel management space as an example, typically when you would go out pre-COVID when you were negotiating, say, a TMC agreement, a travel agency agreement, um, you would typically bench, benchmark that at between 2 to 5% of your airline spend would be a transaction-based TMC model. Well, you didn't have any airline spend in 2020. So now when you try and go out to either negotiate or renegotiate, you have no data to benchmark on. So now enter the world of the SaaS or the travel as a service category or um, negotiations. So if you as a procurement professional aren't, aren't skilled in negotiating a task model, um, it's good to lean on subject matter expertise and folks that have done this before. It is not a completely new model to the industry. It has been around. We have had service models in travel before, but it was not the predominant model um, until now. And you are seeing a lot more of that coming into the market. The other thing we have to keep in mind is one of the blessings that have come out of COVID is we have seen more technology um, enter the market in the travel space as well. And that is actually creating a compression because we are seeing between six to 9% of the cost of travel increasing in that space as well. So you have these two worlds colliding at the same time. Then you have the entire dynamic of the industry playing into it as a whole as well. Um, you have, um, you know, a shortage of rental cars in the market. Well, that is being driven by multiple factors in the industry. So how you would negotiate and measure this is, is really turned upside down. One of the things we are seeing and what we are encouraging when we talk to procurement professionals all the time is we are actually advising a continuous sourcing model right now. So there's a lot more shifting into dynamic sourcing. So, you know, again, looking at your technology stack that you're utilizing to stay ahead of the game um, so that you're not constantly having to, you know, churn that, you you know, issuing RFPs and, and, you know, spinning your wheels, having some technology that predictively tells you when it is the right time to enter the market, when is the right time to get back to the negotiation table in each of the respective categories in travel. 
Um, so I think that is a very uh, key measure that a, a seasoned professional will help keep an eye for you or we, us as consultants can certainly step in. We can have a conversation with procurement teams and ask them, what are your triggers? When do you want to step back to the table? And we will help me, you know, monitor that process for you. And when, it, when the trigger happens, we can you know, come back to you and say, hey, your trigger event happened. It's time to get back to the negotiation table and negotiate. I mean, the things that you are seeing is hotel prices are slowly creeping up. So you need to know when are you going back to the negotiation table. And the suppliers that you had in place may not be there anymore because of, you know, closures and, you know, your hotels just not, you know, not operating anymore. So there's just so many changes in this space as well. The other thing that I will mention as well, if you look at meetings and events as a, as a whole, um, another benchmark there that the companies need to keep in mind is um, between two to five percent of gross profit is typically what is the cost of meetings and events at a company. And that is a huge number. And it's typically left in the hands of the marketing teams. Uh, it always reminds me of, you know, what Sarah Scudder said when she said, typically these folks get a budget, they go straight to the CFO, they just get money, very little approvals, and they, so they get a blank check and they get to go spend marketing. And that so much of meetings and events fall within the marketing space. So there has to be this close collaboration between travel procurement and marketing so that you can actually have better line of sight of what's coming in that space as well. Yeah, great point. Um, you give, uh, for, from your perspective, um, what do you think professionals can do to earn and keep their seat at the table with the business stakeholders? Um, absolute visibility in what's in the pipeline. And again, that's talking to various stakeholders at the table. You have to be talking to sales and marketing teams about how many events are coming down the pipeline so you can have a proactive sourcing. Um, you have all these banked airline tickets that you potentially have in your ticket bank that you can now repurpose. So understanding which projects are happening in the, you know, if you're a project-based company, how you can repurpose those tickets to help offset some of the costs as well. Um, so it's really, and in HR teams, you know, a lot of um, teams are, um, you know, trying to figure out how they're going to bring people back to work. And if you're in an organization that have pivoted to, a, you know, a different work model, you now effectively have a new type of traveler that has entered the ecosystem. Um, you are now having, a, a company may no longer have headquarters. They may have let go of their, their, their real estate footprint. So now they're all virtual. So where are these teams meeting? So that's where your procurement team or your travel coordinators really play a role because it also drives a conversation on meaningful travel. Um, you know, we are all very focused on sustainability um, and how we, our footprint in this space is impacting the environment. So you really have a lot of different stakeholders that come to the table. Um, and travel like it's almost like an HR department as well. It's one of the few categories where everything passes through it at some point. Um, people tend to gravitate through travel at some point in the ecosystem. It's either from a corporate with security from an HR perspective, sales and marketing, um, C-suite executives, it's like everybody seems to gravitate through travel at some point. And, and travel and expense typically live very close together as well because what happens in travel gets expensed. Um, so there is a very close relationship between those two categories as well. Thanks, Anna. Thanks for that. Uh, Yungi, uh, what are your thoughts? What, what, can, uh, what can professionals do to uh, build a strong relationship with their stakeholders? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, following up on what Anna was talking about, um, I think it's really important. This is so basic, right? It's just be able to listen to your stakeholders, really truly understand what's the need that you're that you are trying to address. Sometimes that's not something that everyone agrees on up front. Um, but and also recognizing, right, and listening that you have a lot to learn from them. When I first started in procurement, you know, all my peers, my internal customers, my my procurement peers even were really seasoned and experienced engineers that were super technical. Um, you know, that's not some, that was not an area that I had expertise, um, didn't have the master or PhD, right, to, to say that, but I brought something else to the table. And, and so it's, it was sort of looking at, you know, where are your strengths um, and what can you bring? Um, for, for me, in that area of procurement, it was the first time we had centralized it, right, that function of outsourcing design and manufacturing work um, every R&D team across the company had their own favorite manufacturers to work with. They just kept giving them the same work over and over. Um, there really wasn't any coordination at the supplier level to coordinate, right? What, what's the best contract terms? What, what's the internal strategy even on what do we outsource versus what we're doing ourselves? 
Um, and in fact, we, we had given away a lot of really valuable technical know-how to suppliers that we ended up training to, to be our competitors. That's kind of the, the sad reality. So, um, you know, what we worked on building was really helping to develop that make buy decision process internally with all the right stakeholders to say, you know, this is what we're going to outsource. This is why, um, you know, what's the decision tree that's going to make that determination. Um, and get everyone on the same page as to when is it that we do outsource something and when do we not. And then once we understood, you know, when is it that we want to outsource something, it's, it's looking at building that right stable of suppliers to meet the specific skills um, and the outsourcing needs that we had highlighted. And then in turn, really negotiating, right, the best deals possible with, with those manufacturers. And once once the business stakeholders see that value that you can bring, then then they're willing to partner with you, right, to make that happen. And it's definitely an iterative process. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for that. Um, just so, just so you, you mentioned sort of focus on data as, as one of the key principles that sourcing professionals really need to hone on. Um, as you think about, um, you know, and it's, and, it's, and it's no surprise that, you know, business stakeholders, business leaders, you know, uh, spend more than their fair share looking at their budgets and P&Ls and what they've committed to in terms of productivity both on the revenue side and the bottom lines um, 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 for the for their businesses, to to, to more effectively engage with the stakeholders, um, do you see a need for sourcing professionals to better understand financials and speak that language? At, at first, I didn't know where you're going with that question. <laughs> you know, I, I was interviewing the North Carolina Secretary of State last week. And I asked her about global trade. And she said, yes, I was waiting for you to ask me that question. And so I, I give you the same response, maybe a little less, a little less enthusiasm. Um, but I, I say, yes, absolutely. We, we got to be able to connect the financials to what we're doing. You know, right now on average, unfortunately, and we look at our our operating budgets, our P&Ls at any organization, and you look at all of the work that procurement's doing, there's no connection between the two. Let's go out and do some stuff, and hopefully, if you're sophisticated enough, you can connect that back to the P&L. And, and so a lot of companies have gotten that, that sophistication, but a lot of companies haven't. And so we, we gotta be able to make those connections. I think, Anna, you said it earlier, the line of sight. And so we gotta have that line of sight to everything that we're doing and how it connects back to the financial statements. I'll give you two, just, just off the top, balance sheet and a PL. and If we can connect to those two, we're off to a great start. Now, here's the problem, Serge. Unfortunately, you know, I manage indirect. I manage indirect half of my career, I manage it now. And it's even harder if there's folks on the line that you're managing indirect travel falls in that bucket, marketing depending on the company that you're at, Pausing that bucket. It's even harder, right? Because we're outspent. You know, direct is outspending us four to one, five to one, seven to one. And so we got to make that connection. There's a, a few areas, that, maybe four really quickly. Uh, I'll be short. Uh, but there's four areas that we can focus on, we can practice. As top line growth. Now, how do we contribute to top line growth? Sometimes we think savings, 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 savings. But how do we contribute to top line growth? When COVID happened, there was a decision that we had to make. I get you PPE or you don't operate your business company. <laughs> that, that was a decision that you had, right? So everyone shut down for a period of time for the most part. And it's like, we got to go out and find some stuff. And it's not going to be from the traditional people that we're used to getting it from. And so we got to be able to get the victory. We got to be able to claim that and how we are able to enable a revenue growth or top line growth. As some of you guys may look at it from a comps perspective. Uh, the, the second one uh, would be return on assets. Look, we're all trying to do more with less, especially when it comes to people. We feel the squeeze. But there's the same thing with equipment. How do we extend the useful life of our equipment? And how do we get credit for that? You know, right now, a lot of sourcing organizations out there just buying stuff. Let me buy some spares to get you what you need. But how do we take that and put it into a program and say, no, no, this is a capital program. You know, and Florida Decor is, is, is public knowledge. It's going to spend 200 and in, in, uh and $40 million on capital, All right? So there's some suppliers out there that should be looking at our, our financials saying, is it my way, <laughs> right? And, and so we gotta be able to figure out how do we extend our assets, extend a useful life of our assets in order to drive 
to the bottom line to our, our balance sheet. Uh, the last two really quickly, uh, I'll get into return on investments. Uh, this one is the hardest one for us to calculate. You know, we gotta be a businessman or woman first and then a procurement professional second. We just gotta simply say, am I putting that investment out there? And am I getting, am I getting the money back for the investment that we're putting out there? And that, that one's a whole different level. We gotta figure that out as, as professionals and link it back to the financials. And then and lastly, as one of the most important ones, I guess it goes back to savings to a certain extent, is are we driving margins? Are we driving gross margins? Are we driving net margins? And so what are we doing to support SGNA, cost uh, avoidance, cost reduction? What are we doing to, to reduce our COGS? Uh, but not only reduce it, but control it. In a lot of cases, we're looking at these market indexes. We're looking at steel that's going crazy right now. Hopefully it dropped back down in Q3. Uh, pro, I got a call for propane. Like, oh, what are we using propane for? I got a call for propane last week. Right? And so there's so many different indexes that we got to track and we got to be able to link it to. What are we spending next year? If you don't do anything else, guys, what do we spend this year? And based off everything that's happening, what do I anticipate, anticipate the spend being next year? And we don't do anything else. So yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Great answer. Thanks for that. I mean, I, I think that's a, that's a nice, that's the way summarize what we've heard from 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 the group uh, as well. Um, you know, my my sense is, um, even though there 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 is some top line contribution, you know, procurement and certainly strategic sourcing is always going to be judge based on their contribution to the bottom line, you know, margin expansion, et cetera. Um, and, and there are other derivative benefits uh, to be had from a really strong sourcing program, right? So you, you guys know, you know, mitigating vendor risk, um, you know, the reduction or elimination of, of the tail spend, right? That's, uh, that's du jour right now in the sector you know, um, reducing operational friction, um, right? And as well as providing a, sort of a more robust opportunity for the, our teammates, you know, for those of us in the leadership position to help them have a, a more exciting career rather than engaging in, you know, busy work, you know, pushing paper around. So Leanne, from your perspective, how do you, how do you continue to drive ongoing value from supplier relationships? Thanks, Serge. Really great question and good points there. And Jay Sean just mentioning there around, there's so many different financial metrics that we need to be driving beyond just pure natural cost reduction. Um, and no, no more is that a fit in space than, than brand and marketing. Um, because you know, cheap, cheap marketing doesn't tend to always be effective marketing. So it is one of the categories that you have to have very many different commercial conversations in order to demonstrate ROI in order to demonstrate value for money from, from a brand and market investment point of view. Um, a lot of so, and, and again, the value for me is almost more important when the contract's signed than the part that you do up front because there's so many places where you can get value leakage in brand and marketing if you're not robust in terms of your onboard monitoring of cost. Um, some of the things that, that I do in, in, in my area um, and some of the things that I've brought to Virgin Money is leveraging that so understanding where those opportunities present themselves and demonstrating that you really understand those things and um, I've got lots of third-party contacts so there's specialist agencies in brand and marketing that can help you with benchmarking that can help you to have an understanding of, of how your fees and costs benchmark with other similar organizations or agency models and sizes so it's really important to bring that to the table as, as a procurement professional being able to demonstrate that you know, you can then go and have meaningful conversations with that information and that data um, to allow you to have ongoing success around costs and, and fee models. Um, Utilisation of, so again, this is not natural skill sets for brands and marketing people. So we've got lots of agencies and lots of suppliers helping us to deliver all of our campaigns and, and, and various other things. And it's making sure that you help them to understand, do they have the right resources in the right place and in the right time and that you're measuring that utilization of resource, you're paying for all these third party people to help you to deliver your marketing campaigns. You know, do you have people sitting idle? Do you, so do you have all the people in the right place at the right time? And that's not naturally something that, um, that a brand or a marketing manager potentially either is, is skilled in or even wants to be getting involved in. So that, that for me is something that I very much bring in terms of making sure we're, we're deriving ongoing value from those relationships. Um, 
so, some more boring things. So we obviously brief the agencies, they come up with statement of works. Um, the campaign and marketing team are very good at writing the creative elements of, of that brief, but they never really look at the rate cards that are being used. They don't always, if they've got the budget for these campaigns, they don't always analyze the costs in any kind of way. So even if we've spent time putting contracts and rate cards and everything in place, it's you know, in my role, I very much make sure I go and validate that what's commercially documented matches what I have agreed in the outset. And I've had recent success in the last couple of weeks where one agency had doubled the cost and used a different rate card and the, the marketing team were in a hurry. And if I hadn't touched it, I know it would have been signed. So, you know, it's very much about that's the role. So it's for them to, to measure the creative output, but it's for me to make sure that commercially it's all correct and accurate. So I think we play a role in making sure that you're applying that rigor because otherwise unfortunately suppliers and agencies will see that you're not got a keen eye and might get a little bit more careless around so I think it's making sure they understand that someone is going to be doing that even if it's not the the, the marketing person a little bit more about what Jay Sean was talking there about about how do you measure ongoing value so another big part of my role is performance measurement so it's measuring other things other than just rate cards, rebates, discounts, so that the natural financial things that talk to P&L or whatever have you. Um, obviously in marketing, it's about sales volume. So it's what are the other commercial things that we can be tracking and measuring um, that we can validate and demonstrate to the business that we're bringing more value than just the spend of, of each pound. So lots of things in, in our role around that, that kind of thing and playing a key role in that I think is really important from a a stakeholder influence and credibility point of view and then another big thing that I think that we do and, and I know Sarah and I meet on different networks but one of the other big things that I try to do is not only look at our existing suppliers and agencies and ask them to come in and talk to us about the other services that they have that I don't naturally procure from them so that's like one thing but another thing that I do is speak to other peers in the market and listen to some of the things that they're doing with different suppliers and vendors and agencies and doing sort of supplier showcases so I very much arrange for people who I think are market leading and some of the different industries so FMCG so people out with financial services and, and people out with UK only organizations is bringing those to Virgin Money and asking those brands and those agencies and suppliers to sort of showcase what they do and trying to bring that insight to demonstrate what that could derive in terms of value for, for Virgin Money so um I think as a procurement professional, that really does absolutely help you to build credibility with stakeholders and with your business that you're you're looking beyond just the procurement process or just the end to end supply chain processes. You're looking at your organization and thinking about where it's trying to go for consumers and how you can bring external um, suppliers and vendors that can do quite innovative things in other sectors and apply that to banking. So um, those are some of the things that, that, that I've had some success with. Yeah, so that's that's great. So taking a broader lens to to the business, uh, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and uh, um, we've got a couple of minutes left in the talk, but can you can you uh, share with us a couple of things that you would recommend procurement teams look at to um, help add value to their org organizations? So as a consulting company, the biggest request we're getting from procurement buyers right now is an audit. They just want an audit on their program because the, the world has shifted under their feet. They're not sure on, on many of the categories of buying. The strategies have changed. The suppliers have changed. They need help. They may have lost their resources, et cetera. So the biggest request we're getting is for um, our company to come in and provide a, a quick audit of their program, give them some suggestions and areas they can focus on on sourcing, um, and that covers everything from, you know, the contracts they have in place to the technology suite they have in place and make recommendation in that area. The other thing that I will recommend is if you do not have a meetings and events managed program in place, now's the time to look at that. Um, meetings and events will come back. We all pray it comes back. I think we're all zoomed out. Um, so that will come back. But wrapping your arms around it now is the perfect time because you, it's going to be the least uh, disruptive period you will have in your program to implement significant change that will have a bottom line saving at the end. The last thing I will mention as well is um, going back to Jashun's point, the ROI on travel. Uh, there are some great new technology out there that you can actually in, overlay into your CRM technology that will tie your pre-trip approval to the actual bottom line sell that's generated from it. If you're not looking into that, you really need to look into that as well. That's, that's great. Um, and, uh, Yungi, what, what about you? What approaches have you used to demonstrate value in procurement? 
Yeah, I mean, there's definitely some of the more obvious ways we've addressed right to measure procurement success is, you know, how much money are you saving? What costs are you avoiding for the company? Can you do it faster for everyone? Everyone loves to ask that question. Um, and I think one thing that I found is when we, you know, when, when sourcing organizations operate in a really reactionary environment, we don't really get that opportunity to work with the business owners to plan and strategize and really then understand it, right? And capture what, um, what the business impact of the procurements that we're doing, uh, you know, what does that accomplish? And so when you start, when you move from being reactive to sitting at the table with your business stakeholders, right? To proactively plan for those procurements and the sourcing activities that will help them to meet their goals. Then you have the opportunity to step back and look at the needs from a more enterprise-wide perspective to what Leanne was speaking about um, and really, you know, anticipate what the business needs. So you can set up those supplier relationships and be ready, right? Uh, get the master agreements in place that can help you move much more quickly once those requests come in so that you're not dealing with it on a emergency last minute basis all the time. So. Right, that never happens. Nope, never. <laughs> <laughs> Giselle, what, uh, do you, when you think about value creation, what do you think procurement professionals, um, uh, what do you think they can do to deliver on current needs and perhaps more importantly on, on future needs? Well, yeah, I know, I know we're short on time and this can be a very long conversation, but I'll, <laughs> I'll keep it brief. Uh, we got to predict the pivot. And I think one of the things that we saw, I pick on COVID again, because it changed the world, literally. Um, maybe 10 years ago, if you were a restaurant, whether or not you had a delivery service was hit or miss. You know, most chefs were saying it changes the food integrity, putting it, shuffling it in some box and, and delivering it to somebody 15 minutes away. When I was a kid, actually probably through college, there was only one company that delivered that I remember, which is Domino's. And hopefully you got it in 30 minutes or less. And now I get to pick anything in the yellow pages. That tells you my, my age. I get to pick anything in the yellow pages as what food I want delivered today. And so I, I say that to say, if we were a procurement for a restaurant, we would have said, you're going to need this. You may not know that you need it today, but you're going to need this. And so let's think about the packaging. Let's get with Sarah Scudder and think about that packaging and how we can brand it and get some return on investment on the actual source. But when we source it, it's going to work functionally and we're going to be able to put it inside of some big bag and deliver it to people sitting at home, not doing anything all day. All right, that would have been crazy two years ago, <laughs> but we, we knew that we needed to pivot. It was, it was a thing that, hmm, especially when COVID happened, we knew it then. And so my point is, Inside of our organizations today, whether you're a consultant or you're working internally, companies are pivoting every day. It may not be as drastic as COVID, but is a change of substrate, is a replacement of a raw material, is the speed up of the production schedule, the slowdown of the production schedule. And so we can anticipate and help our organizations pivot on the small things just as we do on the big things. I think we become a much more valuable partner uh, to our, our corporations. I, I have to say, I, I wish we had another hour or two to uh, delve into many of these topics. I, I think it'd be a, a really fantastic conversation. Um, Leanne, Anna, Yungi, Jishan, thanks for sharing these best, best practices. Um, and then um, to, at this point, I just want to hand it over to Sarah. So uh, we did get a question from Maria about how many of your teams evaluated by suppliers that they manage are 360 evaluations for buyers useful. So if any of the panelists wanna type something in the chat or address um, the 360 evaluations quickly before we close out, I'd like to make sure we answer her question. I see, I'm happy to quickly chip in if you want me to. Um, so we don't necessarily manage suppliers within procurement. So it's predominantly managed by the business stakeholder um, that leverages those services. So they tend to be the SRM for, for those suppliers and, and those people. But one of the things we do do um, at the end of every RFP or pitch process is we go out to, to all of the agencies that participated in the pitch and ask for feedback on the procurement processes, on the whole exercise, um, looking to really learn from what that customer experience was like for the vendor going through the process, as well as doing feedback calls to the unsuccessful um, suppliers and what have you. We very much ask them for feedback on what our um, pitch and selection process was like. So we, we do 360 feedback in that respect. All right, great. 
Maria, hopefully that answered your question and feel free to connect with any of the panelists on LinkedIn if you'd like any more feedback um, in regards to evaluations for buyers. Leanne, thank you for that. So I wanna do a big thank you to Serge for um, moderating our panel to get today and putting all the questions in our flow together. Anna, Yangyi, Jashan, and Leanne, thank you so much for joining us. Leanne, I know it's almost dinner time for you. So you've got to, you've got to head out. Um, our next event is going to be May 11th. We host this the second Tuesday of every single month at one Eastern time. So if you enjoyed the conversation today, feel free to join our group next month. Each month we have a different group of speakers, so a different moderator and four separate leaders. We again like to change up the conversation and perspectives each month. This has been recorded. You will get an email from uh, someone on our team on Sunday with a copy of the recording. If you wanna go back and reference or share it with colleagues, um, feel free to do that. We'll also be promoting this on social media and this will be available on our YouTube channel. So we will have this content for others to consume. So with that, I wanna thank all of our speakers today and everyone enjoy the rest of your day and have a productive rest of your week.